The Simple Truth, rising up to explore the difficult topics of real life. Join us as we proclaim the good, the true, and the beautiful with the simple truth of Jesus Christ and His Holy Catholic Church through Scripture, Tradition, and the Catechism. And now, your host, Jim Hayes. Great to be back with you on The Simple Truth, where we proclaim the life-giving reality of Jesus and His Catholic Church. We consecrate everything to the Sacred Heart of Jesus through the Immaculate Heart of Mary and the Pure Strong Heart of St. Joseph. It is Current Events Wednesday, and we're going to be talking today about the corruption and infiltration of the human leadership of the Catholic Church, an unpleasant yet extremely important topic with two terrific guests. First up will be Dr. Taylor Marshall, Catholic husband and father of six, has a PhD in philosophy from the University of Dallas. He's also a popular speaker, teacher, commentator, podcaster, and author of several books, including Infiltration, The Plot to Destroy the Church from Within. You can find him on YouTube at Dr. Taylor Marshall and learn much more about him and all of his good work at taylormarshall.com. And then in the second half of the show, Professor Roberto De Matei will be back with us. Professor De Matei is a Catholic husband and father of five and a Catholic historian who has taught in several Italian universities. He's the author of 35 books, including the Second Vatican Council, An Unwritten Story, St. Pius V, and Love for the Papacy and Filial Resistance to the Pope in the History of the Church. We'll be spending some time on those topics today. But first, as we always do on this current events Wednesday show, it is important that we lead off always by remembering that the number one news story that ought to be reported by all the networks is going unreported today and every day, and that is the ongoing daily government-sanctioned, government-funded, government-protected mass murder of innocent children in the wombs of their mothers, real people, being murdered by the thousands today and every day in our nation which also means the mass exploitation of pregnant moms in need for profit by the lie of abortion. In terms of loss of human life, we have at least a 9-11 every day in the U.S. Imagine 3,000 of any other category of persons being murdered in a given day in our nation and it going unreported by the media and even mostly ignored by the churches. And then imagine if that were happening every day, and you begin to understand something of the insane reality in which we find ourselves. According to a July 2020 article in the prestigious peer-reviewed medical journal The Lancet, we have a global death toll from abortion of 73.3 million children annually, which is over 200,000 preborn children being murdered worldwide every day. It is essential that we put great effort into breaking through our own desensitization to this massive evil. We have to face reality on this and so much more. We must live, proclaim, and push forward the vision that every innocent human being without exception has a right to life. Even an atheist still ought to have the basic moral sense to see the evil of killing an innocent child. For those who believe in Jesus and his Catholic Church, we have the additional benefit of crystal clear, authoritative magisterial teaching on this, which truly gives us absolutely no place to hide in treating those in the womb as any less valuable than us. Catechism of the Catholic Church 2270, human life must be respected and protected absolutely from the moment of conception, meaning fertilization. From the very first moment of his existence, a human being must be recognized as having the rights of a person, among which is the inviolable right of every innocent human being to life. Also, if you've experienced abortion in some way as a mother, father, sibling, grandparent, etc., there are some great people and great resources available to help you in your healing process. We love you. You are not alone. Go to lovewillendchildkilling.com and click on the Healing tab for more information. So let's keep all of this in mind as we talk about the corruption and infiltration of the human leadership of the Catholic Church today, as we ought to seek to understand why the human leadership of the Church refuses to adequately face the evil of abortion and put proportional effort in place to combat it, and yet they go all in, willing to do everything possible to combat a virus that is far, far less of a threat to human life and to the salvation of souls that they are called to serve. Case in point, news from Friday. The headline, in rupture with church's absolute opposition to abortion, Vatican hosting pro-aborts at pro-COVID jab conference. It goes on to say the conference run by 
the Pontifical Academy of Life features prominent directors of global medical associations who have publicly expressed their support for abortion, as well as pro-homosexual and transgenderism issues. So we're in a mess, and we need to understand what is behind this mess if, if, that we're seeing play out right before our eyes within the human leadership of the church. So it makes a lot of sense to bring in the guy who wrote the book, Infiltration, the plot to destroy the, the church from within, to help us put some of these pieces together. Dr. Taylor Marshall, thank you for being with us. How are you today? I'm very well. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's a great blessing to have you with us. For those that are paying attention even a little bit, we're seeing a human leadership within the Catholic Church that based on their actions and inactions, what they're saying, what they're not saying, seem to be much more anti-Catholic than Catholic when it comes to upholding and serving the deposit of faith, the authoritative magisterial teachings of the Church on faith and morals, and this from the top in the Vatican to the disasters that you find on the ground in most every diocese. Your thesis on planned, a planned and executed communist Freemasonic infiltration of the church over the past 150 years makes a lot of sense when you seek explanations for how we got to where we are today. How did you first come to put these pieces together yourself? Well, I, first of all, I want to compliment you for saying the human leadership of the Catholic Church. That's what we're talking about here. The true leader is Christ our Lord. He's the King of Kings, Amen. Our Lady. She's the Queen of Heaven and so on and so forth. So we're talking about the human leadership here on earth. And I'm a convert. I was actually an Anglican priest before becoming a Catholic and came into the church with great joy. Don't regret it at all. It's the pearl of great price. But along the way, as I came into the church, um, I began to see inconsistency. Uh, I think initially it was inconsistency in the pro-life movement. I'm not talking about all priests and bishops, but some. And as time went on, uh, I started seeing confusion about doctrine, moral teaching. And as we moved further and further, you know, past 2013 with that, you know, the confusion around the resignation of Pope Ben XVI, and then more and more confusing, not only statements by Pope Francis, but appointments, uh, disciplinary measures, of course, Cardinal McCarrick and ex-Cardinal McCarrick and all that, uh, it raises the question, I think, for a convert like me or for a cradle Catholic is, why are we seeing the human leadership of the Catholic Church steer the bark of Peter, the church, uh, in a direction that doesn't seem consistent with Catholicism of the last or the previous 1900 years? And so I began to do research, and uh, a lot of people will say, well, it's just Vatican II, and I think that's a major part of it. But if you look at the story and you look at the trends, these changes, these infiltrations, these modifications actually extend back into the 1800s. And so as I was doing research, I wanted to sort of tell uh, the story of church history beginning in the 1830s, 1840s, where popes are actually you know, sounding the alarm and seeing the problems um, going on within the church and kind of all the way up until Pius the Ninth, Leo the Thirteenth, turn of the century into the nineteen hundreds, Pius the Tenth. I mean, vocally talking about the heresy of modernism that is creeping into the church, and so just wanted to document all those things uh, for myself, for my family. I I want to be a Catholic. I want my children to be a Catholic, and I want my grandchildren to be Catholic. You know, it's not just about me; it's about the future generations and and getting back um, to the goal, which is. Jesus Christ in the Holy Eucharist and the faith and morals given by Jesus Christ to the apostles and the preservation of that for the good of good of humanity and for our salvation. So that's what inspired me to write the book. And um, I learned a lot along the way. And, you know, when it first came out, people said, wow, this is kind of a conspiracy theory. But I think over the past two years, it's become more of a conspiracy fact. People are seeing that something uh, is dreadfully wrong in the human leadership of the church. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very important book. Folks can get it. Go to taylormarshall.com. Um, but other than the obvious, which is the snapshot of where we are, um, that it seems to be precisely where we would be if there was a planned and executed plot to infiltrate and destroy the church from within, take us through some of the facts in support of the planning and the execution. Uh, first, in, in terms of the planning, the Alta Vendita seems quite clear. 
Uh, so what was it and what were its main points, specifically with respect to the corruption of the young through seminaries and schools? Yeah, so, you know, in the history, enemies of Christ, enemy of the church, attacked from without. You know, you go back to the first 10 Roman persecutions all the way up through time, even up into the 17, late 1700s, French Revolution. And the enemies of the church, I think, by this time have realized that you know, making martyrs, killing bishops, killing nuns, just makes saints and grows the church. And so, as you mentioned, there was a document called the Permanent Instruction of the Alta Vendita. Its origin is in the early 1800s. Um, and it details how it will take, the author says, perhaps 100 years, if we slowly and carefully infiltrate schools, seminaries, universities, monasteries and convents, and then children. Because they said, it's, you know, it's not enough just to get like the Pope to become a Freemason. I mean, that's kind of a ridiculous goal. The document actually says, let's get a Pope who actually thinks and acts like a Freemason. That would be good enough. And so that's, that's ultimately the goal. And I think, in my opinion, what has happened. Mm -hmm. Yes, when we get back, we're going to go through as much as we possibly can in the next segment, laying out the most important facts when it comes to the planning and execution of that infiltration so we can see it. We want to be able to see what has happened to make sense of where we are and to figure out how we are called to respond to this. This is what this show is about today. We're going to leave you with some encouragement on this as well. We want to gain this understanding for a reason, to do some good with it for our own families and for whatever influence we have beyond that. We'll be right back on The Simple Truth with Dr. Taylor Marshall. Stay tuned. deliverance. Almighty God and Father, we beg thee through the intercession and help of the Archangels, St. Michael, Raphael, and Gabriel, for the deliverance of our brothers and sisters who are enslaved by the evil one, from anxiety, sadness, and obsessions. We implore thee, deliver us, O Lord. From hatred, fornication, and envy. We implore thee, deliver us, O Lord. From thoughts of jealousy, rage, and death. We implore thee, deliver us, O Lord. From every thought of suicide and abortion. We implore thee, deliver us, O Lord. From every form of sinful sexuality. We implore thee, deliver us, O Lord. From every division in our family and every harmful friendship. We implore thee, deliver us, O Lord. From every sort of spell, malefice, witchcraft, and every form of the occult. We implore thee, deliver us, O Lord. Thou who said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, grant that through the intercession of the Virgin Mary we may be liberated from every demonic influence and enjoy thy peace always. In the name of Christ our Lord, amen. As a nonprofit lay organization financially independent from your diocese, our apostolate is listener supported. The Station of the Cross thanks our supporters who have enabled us to broadcast Catholic programs for more than 20 years. Through your generosity, we are able to inspire countless listeners with the gospel message and help lead them to a parish to be spiritually nourished by the sacraments. Thank you for your continued support and may God bless you and your family. Love listening to the Station of the Cross on your car radio, but sometimes find yourself driving outside the listening area? Never miss another minute of your favorite show. Download the iCatholic Radio app so you can listen anywhere in the world 24 hours a day. The iCatholic Radio app is available for your phone in the Apple Store or for your Android phone in Google Play. Visit thestationofthecross.com for more information. The Simple Truth. Jim Havens here with our guest, Dr. Taylor Marshall. He is the author of several books, including Infiltration, The Plot to Destroy the Church from Within. You can find him on YouTube at Dr. Taylor Marshall and learn much more about him and all of his good work at taylormarshall.com. Talking a little bit right now about some of the facts. I want to lay out the most prominent facts that we can to help everyone to see this plot to, to infiltrate the church that, that goes back quite a while. And so um, on those facts, when it comes to the planning and execution, I guess one more point on the planning 
that I'd like to get out there is that um, you mentioned it a bit there, um, Dr. Marshall. You said that, um, you know, in talking about the popes, that we had many popes in the 19th century, in the early 20th century. Um, they're writing encyclicals. They're warning about and condemning Freemasonry, communism, socialism, liberalism, modernism. You write in the book that uh, Pius X recognized that Freemasonry would not square off openly against Catholicism, but would undermine her from within with ideas. He at once identified this internal Freemasonic attack as modernism, the naturalism of Freemasonry with a Catholic veneer that justifies itself by appealing to the evolution of dogma. So it, it seems when we have these popes um, in the 19th century, in the early 20th century, providing this clear teaching that these ideas are not Catholic, that they are not compatible with being a disciple of Jesus. They are against the faith of the Catholic Church that Jesus instituted. Doesn't it seem obvious when you read what they were writing that they knew that the Church was under attack at all levels, including from within? Yes, there's actually a, a double warning. As you mentioned, every single pope in succession making these warnings to the church. But in, the 19, in 1917, we had the approved apparition of Our Lady of Fatima, in which she asked for the consecration of Russia, people to pray the rosary every day, and she warned that the errors of Russia would spread throughout the world. And this, of course, is the political, economic, and social uh, manifestation of Marxism throughout the world. Just before that, you had Pope Leo XIII writing the St. Michael prayer and saying at the end of every low mass, this prayer must be said because he had some kind of apparition or vision. Uh, and when he awoke from that, and there's many different versions I go through it in the book, um, he composed this prayer. So the warnings were manifest. And unfortunately, as we move into the 1930s, the 40s, and especially into the 50s, we see so many in the church, and I'm talking about at the cardinal level, wanting to evolve doctrine, morality, liturgy, and then also manipulate appointments in the hierarchy, which of course affects the College of Cardinals and appointment of bishops all over the world. Ask yourself, how did McCarrick become the number one prelate in the hierarchy of the United States of America in Washington, D.C., rubbing shoulders with you know, Barack Obama and Bill Clinton and, and making all these Episcopal appointments and having all these connections in Rome and connections we've discovered now in China. All of these things are part of this infiltration to, again, evolve doctrine, morality, liturgy, and affect appointments to key offices in the church. And we have seen this, especially since the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And unfortunately, we're still suffering through it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What else would uh, would you think would be most prominent in terms of facts that demonstrate the execution of this communist Freemasonic plot to infiltrate the church? Uh, some items that stand out to me are the testimonies of Bella Dodd and Manning Johnson, the guilt and expulsion of Archbishop Bonini, uh, the shark Sindona, and uh, the, the St. Gallen Mafia. Uh, what do you see as being at the top of the list? Well, all of those are very important. I think the St. Gallen Mafia is very important because it reveals um, antagonism to Benedict XVI and a promotion of Cardinal Bergoglio, who becomes Pope Francis. This is the red hot, you know, the bullet points that people think, oh, come on, this is too crazy. But you actually have Cardinal De Niels admitting that there was a St. Gallen Mafia that met in St. Gallen, Switzerland that wanted to push forward a progressive agenda. They even state uh, legal, uh, legalization of abortion, women's ordination, uh, and these kind of ideas that are being tolerated and promoted by these, and I will say, wicked prelates in the church. And it's their own self-admission. You know, we don't have to go into conspiracies. We can read their very own words. And so, I mean, empirically, you look at the data, what is it? Less than 30, less than 20% of American Catholics believe in the real presence, believe in transubstantiation. This shows that catechesis and doctrinal teaching has completely degraded from who is responsible for teaching these things, the hierarchy, the church, and yet they have failed to do so. There's just confusion on even on, you look at the demographics for pro-life, 
evangelical Protestants are more pro-life in America than Catholics. And yet this is one of our key pivotal teachings in this time. This is, this is witness to the fact that not only are these things not taught, but there is confusion. For example, Joe Biden, Nancy Pelosi, they are all in good standing, promoted by cardinals, bishops, promoted by priests. Mm -hmm. And they are 100% opposed to the teaching of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Mm -hmm. You just take up all these data points and you scratch your head and you say something is dreadfully wrong right now in the human leadership of the Catholic church. All right. And uh, one other point that jumps out to me as, as you're going through that list is, uh, you know, from the, um, the the different surveys and things that have been taken, um, the the regular, uh, I guess, the, the Catholics that respond to these surveys and polls, um, they are more pro-homosexual um, than the general population of the United States. So how does that happen? How does that how does that idea get in, even in more ingrained within the church than in the general population of the United States? You, you have to wonder what in the world is going on here. And I, I do think uh, your book outlines it puts forth facts that people need to face and deal with. Again, it's infiltration. Folks can get it at Taylor Marshall. Dot com and look I'd love to have so much uh, more time with you to uh, to really get a lot more out here but um, and, and it would be great to have you on to discuss this further sometime but but I want to make sure to get this in the way you close the book um, you, you you close it with some encouragement you write that quote good men must throw off cowardice and weakness and stand under the banner of Christ with their hands readied for battle end of quote and you point to the rebuilding of the wall in Nehemiah 4 how each of the builders had his sword girded at his side while he built and you connect that for us to pray in the rosary um, and I want to just give a shout to fathers here the enemy wants to infiltrate your family all right we, we've got to fight hard to protect those that are entrusted to us don't make the same mistake that many of the so-called good bishops have made that, that have been permissive that have been weak and have allowed these things to happen in their dioceses on their watch and it also reminds me of something saint louis de montfort wrote about he, he talked about the saints of the end times that they would be battling uh, with one hand and building with the other and that they would be um, drawing all men to a true devotion to mary and through this will make many enemies but it will also bring about many victories and much glory to God alone. So close us with some uh, encouragement here. What jumps out for you to encourage us today? Well, Archbishop Fulton Sheen said, you know, a time will come when the laity will, will have to battle. And, you know, just like that quote from Nehemiah 4, we have to rebuild the walls. You know, this is the walls of Jerusalem. You know, the, the heart of Jerusalem is the temple. It's the liturgy. But unless there's walls there, the enemy can continue to come through. And that's what happened in the Old Testament over and over until they finally lost the temple and they, and they lost the liturgy. They were becoming idolatrous along the way as well. We must focus. We lay people, we don't, you know, we're not priests. You and I don't celebrate the Holy Sacrifice, the Mass. What we do is we hold the walls. We protect we, we do battle with our rosaries, with our prayers, with our devotions, with our fastings, with our penance. And we're there to hold that wall up and to protect what's going on inside. And, you know, where do the priests come from and where do the nuns and sisters come from? They come from the families. And you, like you said, they want to infiltrate the church. They want to infiltrate our families. And we have to make sure that our families are based on Christ, based on his teaching. So that means fathers teach your kids traditional catechism lead the rosary every night find traditional liturgy find a good priest who when your children go to confession they aren't told something morally wrong in the confessional we have to we actually do have to try harder because it's more trying times so i think the encouraging thing is is even though all these things are going on in the human leadership in the heavenly leadership of jesus christ he's providing all the graces the sacraments, the things that we need to hold that line and to build the walls and to protect Jerusalem, which is Holy Mother Church. And uh, that's what we're called to do. You know, we don't have to, we're not cardinals, we're not popes. We have a very defined role and, and that's it. So let's do it. And I think we'll be blessed and hopefully we'll find our, our, ourselves before Christ one day saying, well done, good and faithful servant by his grace. 
Yeah, yeah, and, and you know, you do a great job in the book as well, keeping it in context, all of this in context of the spiritual battle that goes back to the beginning of, of time, Lucifer, Satan, uh, the demons, right? And, and every lie can really be traced back to that. I, I will not serve. That's the battle cry. Um, but what I guess, um, what jumps out to you in terms of this battle that is going on and the spiritual weapons at our disposal, I would just love for you to share a little bit on, uh, on the Holy Rosary as, uh, as we close it up. Yeah, the, the rosary, you know, Pius X said family should pray the rosary every day. Our Lady of Fatima in 1917, as we mentioned, she came down from heaven to Portugal and said, pray the rosary every day. She actually said a third. That's five decades every day. It's like, you know, if my wife sees one of my children about to get hit by a car, she will run out into the street and grab that child. That's what Our Lady did in 1917. All these things were happening. She came down and she ran into the street into the traffic to save us and the protection is the rosary um, and every great saint since saint dominic the popes even magisterial documents encourage us to pray the rosary every day and the rosary is really meditating on the life of christ sacred scripture and asking our lady to help us to understand who he is and what he taught and she says in the Magnificat, my soul magnifies the Lord. So Mary is the magnifying glass that helps us see Jesus. And the rosary is a 18, 22 minute, depending on the time, um, easy guided prayer so that we can spend time every day focused on Christ the King. It's hard to pray by yourself for 22 minutes. If you have those beads, you have the prayers, you have the mysteries, everything is set up to just carry you along the way so that you can make fruitful prayer for 20 minutes. And yes, our mind wonders and there's difficulties along the way, but it's, you know, it's like these training wheels on the side of our bike that keep us up so we don't fall over to the left or over to the right. And the rosary is, I and mean, that's why it's so recommended, is it keeps us daily focused on him. Hmm. Yes, and uh, you know the, the saints of old, they would have been praying this. They would think of the rosary as the full rosary, praying all sets of, of the mysteries every day. And so that is something to propose and to get back to. Can we can we do a little bit more, right? Uh, St. Louis de Montfort says, hey, for children, it's good for them to pray one set of mysteries, uh, but for everybody else, pray them all, right? Let, let's, let's strive to be generous in this. And then that prepares us even all the more uh, to go to, to mass and receive our Lord in that state of grace with, with that full, as full a yes as we can bring uh, to receive him in Holy Communion. Um, so we've got the treasure. We've got the pearl of great price. Uh, Dr. Taylor Marshall, thank you for coming on today and helping us to uh, grow in some understanding. I think that is very, very helpful for us. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, we're going to be right back with Professor Roberto De Matei. But again, get infiltration, taylormarshall.com. God bless you. Here at the Station of the Cross, we proudly bring the truths of the Catholic faith to countless listeners through radio and mobile devices. And we're grateful for the feedback we've received. I'm a, a widower parent of three almost adults and listen to you guys around the clock. Father McTig, Society of Jesus, he's wonderful. My mother Miriam, of course, the Divine Office and many other great things that Station of the Cross does. So thanks very much for your great work. I had a friend at work email me and tell me about the Station of the Cross a couple months after it started. And I was so excited, I tuned into it, and I found that I love the Catholic Station. If you've been blessed by listening to the Station of the Cross, let us know. Call 1-877-888-6279, extension 112. Then share your testimonial with us. Husbands, have you ever worried about the risks to your wife's health from the birth control method she's using? Why not learn a natural method of family planning that is 99% effective in postponing pregnancy and causes no risks to your wife's health? Find all the information you need for natural family planning classes or the home study course from the Couple to Couple League website at www.ccli.org or call 513-471-2000. 
Jesus 911. Now, weekdays at 2 p.m. Eastern. My name is Jesse Romero. I'm a retired Los Angeles cop. I'm a Catholic lay evangelist. My show on spiritual warfare is called Jesus 911, where you got three retired LA cops, Ruben Nava, Eddie Chavez, talking about the Catholic faith and teaching you spiritual warfare, how to defend yourself against the devil, the world, and the flesh. Catch the Soul Patrol, Jesus 911, 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, on the Station of the Cross and the iCatholic Radio mobile app. Welcome back to The Simple Truth. Jim Havens here. We are talking corruption and infiltration of the human leadership of the Catholic Church today. Our next guest is Professor Roberto de Mattei. He is a Catholic historian and author of 35 books, including The Second Vatican Council, An Unwritten Story, Love for the Papacy, and Filial Resistance to the Pope in the History of the Church, and St. Pius V. We had a great episode with Professor de Mattei on his most recent book, St. Pius V, only a few weeks ago, and you can find that wherever you find the podcast or show. Uh, but Professor De Mate, thank you so much for being back with us. How are you today? Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's great to be with you on this uh, great feast day of um, the, the sorrow of Our Lady, Our Lady of Sorrows. Um, so your book, Love for the Papacy and Filial Resistance to the Pope, was published in 2019. And back in 2017, in an article that you wrote on the Buenos Aires letter and Authentic Magisterium, you stated, quote, both reason and the census fide demand resistance, including public resistance, to a pope who promotes, encourages, and favors errors and heresies within the church. End of quote. What does it mean to both have a love for the papacy and at the same time have a filial resistance to Pope Francis? Well, uh, well, the church is a visible and a hierarchical society which culminates in the papacy. Um, the papacy is an institution founded by Jesus Christ, and whoever loves the church loves the papacy. However, uh, it is important, it is necessary to distinguish the institution um, the institution of the papacy from the person of, of the of the pope because the church is uh, divine but uh, the pope is not a divinity is a man capable of, of sinning and also of losing the faith if uh, if the pope does not correspond to the graces uh, he has received and uh, if um, if he, he does not uh, uh, carry out his uh, uh, lofty uh, mission, and so um, the catechism uh, teaches us that uh, the, the Pope should be obeyed uh, because obedience, uh, of course, is a, is a moral virtue, a, a, a virtue which binds us to the will of the superior. And of course, of all the authorities in the world, the uh, papacy, the Pope, uh, it is the, the supreme, the supreme authority. I mean that there is none authority uh, higher, higher than the, the, the that of the Pope. But obedience is never uh, unconditional. It has its limits. Uh, uh, its limits. Its limits above all in the will of uh, of God. Will of God, which is expressed in the natural and divine uh, law, and in the tradition of, of the Church, of which uh, the Pope is the guardian. It is. Uh, uh, it is not the uh, creator. And uh, and uh, I think that today there is a, a widespread uh, tendency of making um, every word or, or action of, of the Pope out to be infallible. Uh, and I think that uh, he errs, uh, who uses sarcastic or irreverent words uh, um, in regard to the Pope, but, but uh, the dutiful homage which is given to the, the vicar of, of Christ is necessary because it is not turned to the man 
uh, to the single person, but to him, um, uh, to him whom he represents, because the Pope is the Vicar of G Jesus Christ. And uh, and uh, also uh, we have to to remember always uh, that the words of Saint Peter: it is necessary to obey God rather than uh, than a man. And uh, uh, against uh, obedience, uh, one may sin by excess, uh, be obeying uh, things which are not uh, bind, which which are uh, illicit. But uh, you can. Uh, uh, you can see also by defect uh, disobeying in uh, those things uh, which are uh, licit. And uh, the criteria by which the faithful may resist an unjust uh, order of the supreme ecclesiastical authority is based not on the private judgment uh, uh, which uh, affirms uh, in, in principle the independence uh, of the human uh, reason, but upon the, the our sensus fidei, um, if, uh, for example, uh, a pope uh, would like to impose a common prayer with the Muslims, or to abrogate the ancient um, Roman uh, rite, or to introduce a marriage for priests, I think that uh, it would be necessary to oppose this by a, a, a respectful but firm resistance. Uh, the census fide would oppose this, but uh, the greater opposition, so much the, the more should it be accompanied by a renewed love for the papacy for, for the church and uh, for the founder of the church um, who is uh, Jesus uh, Jesus Christ this is I think the the, the rule mm -hmm. yes very important distinctions there what are some of the most prominent errors and heresies within the church being promoted encouraged and favored by Pope Francis well uh, I, perhaps you know that I am one of the promoters of the Correctio Filialis, um, this uh, statement document addressed uh, to Pope Francis on the 11th of August uh, um, uh, 2019, uh, three years uh, ago. This document uh, was signed by more than 60 um, ca scholar, Catholic s scholars, uh, uh, pastors of the church, uh, pers personalities, uh, and uh, and you know that the the, the answer to this correction was uh, was silence. Well, um, about the errors of Pope Francis, um, I think that uh, uh, the, the main uh, the main the main uh, error is uh, the. What um, a friend of mine and Jose Antonio Reta has defined the paradigm shift. Paradigm shift, uh, we, uh, which is a, a term used by the same uh, Pope Francis in the Apostolic Constitution um, Veritatis Gaudium, and uh, this this term paradigm shift. Um, uh, is a, a synonym for for cultural revolution. So there is a cultural re revolution, a, a cultural revolution, which is a, a, a new concept conceptual model of the church, which replaces the old one. And a primary area of this discontinuity of this cultural revolution is uh, uh, about uh, the so-called uh, non-negotiable principles, uh, some values uh, which were uh, so important uh, to, to, to John Paul II, the Benedict XVI, uh, and like uh, family, uh, life, uh, education, these values are absent or reduced uh, to a, a minimum in the uh, pastoral horizon of, of Pope Francis. And uh, Pope Francis' uh, relativization of morality um, 
my opinion, uh, had its most uh, uh, noteworthy expression in the phrase, uh, who am I uh, to judge? Uh, to judge an homosexual uh, person. Uh, this phrase was uttered in uh, July 2013, uh, I think, while uh, um, returning uh, the Pope was uh, uh, during a flight. And, uh, and the, the interpretation of this statement by the mass media was a, a papal endorsement uh, um, of homosexual practice, and this endorsement was never uh, corrected or clarified by the, by the OEC. And uh, you remember also the, the support uh, following these words uh, of Pope Francis uh, to the American Jesuit Father uh, James Martin, who uh, has committed for decades uh, to making the Church accept uh, the LGBT community and its um, lifestyle. But, uh, but um, anyway, the, the most striking example of the paradigm shift and of this uh, cultural revolution, uh, in my view, is the post synodal apostolic exhortation of Maurice and Letizia, which uh, uh, foresaw a case by case possibility. Uh, of uh, admitting the divorced uh, the, and uh, civilly remarried uh, persons uh, to Holy Communion. And uh, while affirming that it uh, did not uh, wish uh, to change ch uh, church uh, doctrine on the indissolubility of the, of the marriage, uh, this document uh, permits uh, the divorced and the civilly remarried uh, people to be absolved in uh, confession and to receive Holy Communion without, uh, without uh, committing it to, to, to living as brother and sister. I think uh, that this is perhaps uh, the, the, the more important uh, paradigm shift uh, in, the last, uh, in the last years. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you for, for helping us to, to understand some of those areas. Now, you also write that uh, without the assistance of history, it is difficult to understand what the correct attitude of Catholics should be in the hour of trial, and that for this reason, you often use historical examples showing how they can help us to face situations that seem unprecedented and present no obvious way out. What are two or three most uh, of the most important historical examples that you can share with us briefly to help us today? Well, uh, uh, men uh, tend to simplify and to imagine uh, history as a, a straight uh, line that uh, accents uh, or descends uh, uh, depending um, on whether we understand it as a path uh, of irreversible progress or on the contrary um, as a decay. But the, the story, the, story, the history of the church is, is uh, in reality is more complex because uh, uh, because uh, um, the history of the church uh, takes place under the banner of the of the church of of the cross uh, the holy cross of christ and uh, and it is a dramatic um, story in which uh, a story in which moment of apparent uh, defeat uh, are interwined um, a moment in which everything seems l lost uh, and uh, some other moment uh, uh, of victories, of triumph, in which uh, the, uh, the, the the church uh, the church uh, shows that her, her real uh, path is a journey of triumph that uh, will culminate uh, at the end of the time with the defeat of the Antichrist. And uh, you, you have asked me about uh, some examples. Uh, for, um, for example, in the first three centuries of uh, her existence, the church was cruelly persecuted by the Roman Empire. And when, uh, uh, in the fourth century, an emperor, Constantine, restored the liberty to the church, and the Christian started to lay the foundation for a new Christian society, the church was shaken uh, within by the hurricanes 
of the Aryan crisis. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, the Aryan crisis, uh, one of the worst uh, of times. And when we get back, we're going to have Professor De Mate help us a little bit further in terms of historical perspective, sharing some more historical examples for us that will help us in our day, specifically something called Nicodemism. I'm going to ask him about um, something that popped up in the 16th century and then get his view on the infiltration of the church today. How, has it been infiltrated? And how would you characterize that infiltration? Much more to come with Professor De Mate. Stay tuned. Hello, beloved. This is Mother Miriam. I know you are aware of the current evil and unprecedented attacks on the church, our country, and the world. Never was it more crucial to know and live our holy Catholic faith, to teach it to our children, and to bear witness to the world through our lives. We need to support Catholic apostolates who do not and will not compromise on the life-giving and life-saving truths of the gospel. The Station of the Cross is one such apostolate. I pray that you will join me in supporting them, most especially during their upcoming fall on-air appeal September 27th through October 1st. There are several ways you can donate even now by phone at 1-877-711-8500 on the internet at thestationofthecross.com through the donation page of your iCatholic radio app or simply by returning the envelope from the recent fall appeal mailing. I look forward to being with you each day at 10 a.m. Eastern September 27th through October 1st on the Station of the Cross. God bless you. Each weekday from 10 to 11 a.m. Eastern, the Station of the Cross brings you Mother Miriam Live. It is Christ's church. He will build it. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. But it's time for us, the remnant, to step up and do everything we can. Tune in from 10 to 11 a.m. Eastern for Mother Miriam Live on the Station of the Cross and our free iCatholic Radio mobile app. You can also watch the video stream every day on Facebook or on YouTube. Praise be to Jesus. Hi, this is Joe McLean, host of the Catholic Drive Time Morning Show, joining you on the Station of the Cross Catholic Radio Network each weekday morning at 7 a.m. We'll keep you informed and inspired with insightful guests and breaking news stories of the day. That's the Catholic Drive Time, weekday morning, 7 a.m. on the Station of the Cross and the iCatholic Radio app. We'll see you then. May God love you. Back to the Simple Truth, Jim Havens here with our guest today, Professor Roberto de Mate. He is a Catholic historian and author of 35 books, including Love for the Papacy and Filial Resistance to the Pope in the History of the Church, and also St. Pius V. Professor, you were pointing out to us right before the break some historical examples to help us for this time of crisis we're in, give us some historical context. Um, and also, I want to point you towards um, to one that you mentioned in your recent book on St. Pius V, that in the 16th century, quote, while in Europe, Protestantism openly revolted against the Roman Church. In Italy, the religious revolution sought to make the edifice collapse from within. In order to reach this end, the heretics developed a doctrine, or rather a strategy, called Nicodemism, end of quote, which um, was a kind of infiltration of the church. Can you explain to us and anything more you want to share in terms of historical examples, but specifically also um, on the rise of Nicodemism, and is that still alive today, this Nicodemism? Um, yes, uh, well, uh, Nicodemism is can be generally defined um, as the practice of religious dissimulation or simulation in, in context or more or less open persecution. And, uh, and Nicodemita was the name that the 16th century French um, revolutionary uh, John Calvin gave to, to Protestants living in Catholic countries, uh, Protestants, uh, Calvinists, uh, who chose to conceal their faith out uh, of a concern for personal safety. And so in order to reach this, this end, uh, I mean, to, to be safe in the Catholic country, uh, these uh, heretics, uh, Protestants, uh, developed a doctrine or, or rather a, a strategy 
called uh, uh, Nicodemism uh, after Nicodemus, um, who was the man in the Gospel of Saint John, who, who went to, to visit Jesus Christ by night in order not to be recognized as a disciple. Um, it is considered uh, Nicodemus a saint by, by, by the Church. But, uh, but the, the Protestant, uh, the Calvinist strategy was based on the idea that uh, um, a heretic of whatever sort could live in a Catholic country without uh, having to openly profess his doctrine or flee to another country uh, as many were, were doing. Um, instead, it was necessary to build up a, a, a secret, uh, a secret uh, network, a web of re relationships, uh, hiding uh, one's own uh, opinions until coming to, to the point, uh, if possible, of occupying the throne of Peter. Well, if uh, this did not happen, uh, it was thanks uh, to a few intrepid defenders uh, of the faith, and uh, in particular three inquisitors destined uh, uh, to become popes, three popes, three great popes, uh, Paul the IV, uh, uh, Pius V, and Sixtus V. Uh, St. Pius V is famous uh, for, for being the winner of the Battle uh, of Lepanto. We will have an anniversary in the next uh, month of, uh, of the 7th of October. We will, I will celebrate this anniversary in, in, a, in a room. And uh, in uh, the book I uh, wrote about uh, St. Pius V, uh, we are, in the book uh, you have quoted, I dedicate a chapter to his fight against uh, um, uh, on, on the Battle of Lepanto, but I dedicate also a chapter to, to, to the fight of St. Paul V against uh, the, the, the crypto heretics within the Church. Uh, because Pius the V uh, fought against a crypto heretical party called the, the uh, spiritualists or also the evangelicals, uh, very influential in the Roman Korea. Uh, the, the, this this, uh, this man, the spiritualist, uh, secretly professed the, the Lutheran doctrine of justification by faith alone and despised the traditional rites, the traditional practices of the Church, to which they oppose the interior illumination of, of, of this spirit uh, as a, a, a rule of faith. And, uh, and St. Paris the Fifth was aware of this, uh, of this secret move movement and fought uh, very, very, very strongly against them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we had some good, strong leadership back then that was able to uh, sniff it out and stomp it out. Um, but today, I I'm sure you're familiar with Dr. Taylor Marshall's book, Infiltration. In your view, has the church been infiltrated? And if so, how do you characterize that infiltration and what ought to be done about it? Uh, well, the church from its origins uh, has had internal and uh, external enemies. Of course, the, the most uh, da dangerous are the internal enemies, the infiltrators, because they represent a, a Trojan horse within the, the city of God. But uh, in, my view, in my view, we must distinguish between two kinds of infiltration into the church. Uh, on the one hand, the church has been infiltrated by external enemies, such, for example, uh, in the in the 60s, the communists, who wanted to destroy the, 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 the church from within. And this happened, for example, uh, during the Second Vatican Council. Um, we know by, by, by the documents that uh, the communist governments and the secret services of the East Bloc countries, like uh, KGB and the 
East German Stasi penetrated the Vatican so as to promote their interests and infiltrate the highest ranks of the Catholic hierarchy. We know, for example, for example um, that um, during the years of the, of the Vatican II and of the post-conciliar period, the Hungarian College in Rome became a branch office of the secret services of Budapest. And every rector of the college between 1965 and 1987 was a trained, skillful agent with ex expertise in both disinformation um, operation, disinformation operations and uh, bagging. This I define this uh, as uh, uh, the infiltration of external enemies, but uh, there are also the the infiltration of the internal en uh, enemies, uh, and uh, uh, they are those uh, within the church who have progressive uh, positions, and neo modernist position, people who instead of leaving the church decide to remain within it to transform the church. So, so the modernists, modernists, for example, um, where they are heretics who don't want to leave the church, but they want to, to transform it from within. And it is important to remember that the St. Pius the Tenth understood that he was uh, dealing uh, uh, not only with a, a philosophical school, the modernism, but with a political party. And in the motu proprio Sacrorum Antistitum of the first September, um, he advanced the hypothesis that modernism formed a true and a real secret society within the church. But perhaps I can a little, uh, I can stop a moment and 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 speak after about this. Yes, yeah, we'll, we'll have to bring you back on, Professor. There is so much more uh, to talk about with you. I also want to point people to your article today on Our Lady of Sorrows. Go to voiceofthefamily.com to read that. Thank you, Professor, and God bless you.